You're listening to audio from Cities Church. You can find more resources and learn about our ministry by visiting citieschurch.com. Before we get started, go ahead and look again closely at verse 20. <clears throat> verse 20 there. Here, here's what's going on. The brothers of Joseph have conspired against him, and uh, they are plotting murder and deception as the way to get rid of him. And they say here in verse 20, after they have uh, proposed their evil plan to each other, they say, and we will see what will become of his dreams. So after the brothers have conspired to destroy Joseph, they say about his future, now we'll see. Those those three words, now we'll see. I think these are the most sinister and ironic words in the entire Bible. They're relevant both to the story of Joseph here in Genesis 37, and they're also relevant for our own lives. Now, at one point uh, in the story of Joseph here, which is chapter 37 all, all the way to chapter 50, this is one of the most brilliant stories ever told. Um, this is an amazing event in the ancient world, an amazing event in the book of Genesis, and it has a ripple effect that lasts throughout the rest of of scripture, the, the word plays in this story and the reversals and the ironies are just simply remarkable in Genesis 37. And, and no doubt about it, this is just a great story. And I don't want us to forget this. This story matters for how we live. This is a story for us. This story is relevant for our lives. And so I want us to get there in this sermon and over the next several weeks. And so the plan for this sermon is basically just three parts that are going to walk through this chapter here, chapter 37. We're going to look at each of these in three steps, right? Three steps. The first is we have the context, which is right here. Second, we have the characters. And then third here, we have the conspiracy. So context, characters, and conspiracy. And we're just going to walk through each of these three parts. And as we do, I think we're going to see that the relevance for us continues to increase. So let's pray together and we'll get started. Father, as we're gathered now in this moment, gathered here by your grace with your word open, we ask, Father, as Kimmy prayed, speak to us. Open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to start with the context. And when I say context, like I'm talking about the high level strategy of this narrative in the book of Genesis. The story of Joseph takes up a lot of room in the book of Genesis, but this story is about much more than Joseph. Joseph is a key piece of the story. He's the main character in a way, but there are at least two things that are happening here that are much bigger than Joseph, okay? One is looking back and the other is looking forward. I just want to mention these as we're getting into the story here. The first is if if we're looking back, the story of Joseph, um, it actually picks up on something that God told Abraham way back in Genesis 15. Genesis 15 is the chapter where God makes his covenant with Abraham. God promises to bless Abraham. Uh, Abraham believes God's promise. and, And God tells Abraham in verse 13, you guys might remember this, verse 13, God says, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now, we've already seen Jacob sojourn in a land not his own. J- Jacob, as we've seen several weeks ago, was a, he was sojourning as a servant under Laban in Haran, and, and he was there for 20 years. But He was there for only 20 years, and God told Abraham that his offspring would sojourn for 400 years, which means we've not gotten there yet in this story. We've not yet gotten to what God said in Genesis 15. And at this point, in chapter 37, Jacob is back in the land of Canaan. So he's back home, in a sense. And so we should be wondering, we should be asking, how do Jacob and his sons end up leaving Canaan to sojourn all over again? Okay, That's the question that Genesis 15 should make us wonder. How will God, how will what God said in Genesis 15 be true of Abraham's offspring? Because they're back home. 
There's a little hint, I think, in, in chapter 37 that Jacob, he still hasn't quite settled in Canaan. I think a little hint is found uh, there in the word, the generations of Jacob in, in chapter 37. That's meant to be contrasted with the generations of Esau in chapter 36. So chapters 36 and 37 are meant to go side by side here in Genesis. And we're told last week we saw in chapter 36, verse 1, these are the generations of Esau. And then in verse 8, we read, Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. And then we're just given a list of names for the sons of Esau, almost like a box score, and it's, we're kind of done with Esau. But then in chapter 37, the situation with Jacob is much different. Jacob has not settled anywhere. Instead, we read that Jacob is living in the land of his father sojourning, which has this idea that Jacob is still moving around in the land of Canaan. He has not settled like Esau. And when we see the generations of Jacob here in 37, we don't see a list of names. Instead, we see a story. We see the generations of Jacob, and we see a story about his sons, which means this whole thing with Jacob is still unfolding. There is more to come for the sons of Jacob. And according to Genesis 15, there is like 400 years of sojourning more to come. And so as we're reading through this, we're kind of waiting to see when is that going to happen. Now, we know if we keep reading through Genesis, we get to the book of Exodus, and we know that Exodus, it shows us, Exodus shows us that Egypt is the place where the house of Jacob ends up. That's where they sojourn. So Genesis 15, God is foretelling Abraham that one day his offspring will be captive in Egypt. The book of Exodus shows us, we see there, that the house of Israel is captive in Egypt. And the story of Joseph is the story of how that happens. Okay, this is an important story at a, a macro level for that reason. The story of Joseph picks up and explains what God said in Genesis 15, and it bridges the gap for how we get to the book of Exodus. So this is what's explaining to us where the people of Israel end up. That's, that's high level looking backwards. Now, there's something else the story of Jacob does, and this is, this is more looking forward. And I just want to mention it here. I won't say too much about it because we're going to talk about it a lot over the next few weeks. But it's that the story of Joseph, um, it, it features the rise of Judah. All right, Judah is the fourth son of Leah, and there is nothing super special about him yet in Genesis. He's just one of the 12 sons. Um, and uh, just like a normal guy. Except we know if we le read later in the Bible storyline that Judah becomes very important. That's because King David is a descendant of Judah. And ultimately, Jesus is a descendant of Judah. And so we know Judah is a big deal. He becomes a big deal. But when do we start to see that in the Bible? Like, like when does Judah start to become an important person in the Bible storyline? And the answer is right here in the story of Joseph. In the story of Joseph, Judah starts to become important, and we'll see much more of that. And that's just the context, okay? I just want to mention that. That's high-level stuff here. That's the context. But now let's work our way into the story and talk about the characters because the characters carry the story. And the characters in this story are all the sons of Jacob. Again, the story focuses on Joseph, but the story really is about all the sons of Jacob and the first thing we see here about these sons, these brothers, is that they do not get along. They have conflict. And so if you've been reading through Genesis, believe it or not, Joseph and his brothers have relational strife. Brothers, once again, are having issues. And we've seen this so many times in Genesis already. Brothers cannot seem to get along. Their brothers are always against one another. It goes back to Cain and Abel. And then, of course, there's Isaac and Ishmael. And then there's Jacob and Esau. And then here again in chapter 37, we're supposed to see right away as we start reading in this chapter that once again, the whole brothers thing is not working out. Apparently, Joseph, at some point, had been working with his brothers in the fields, and he brought a bad report about them to Jacob. We see that right away in verse 2, which tells us we, Joseph is kind of a tattletale. 
All right, he brought this bad report to Jacob about his brothers. And then so add to the fact that him being a tattletale, the fact that, that Jacob loved Joseph more than he loved his other sons, and he didn't hide that. Like, I don't know how your parents, you know, how, how this lands on you, but he had a favorite, and he wanted everyone to know that he had a favorite. So Jacob made Joseph this really nice robe that caused Joseph to stand out from his brothers. Verse 3 calls this a robe of many colors. And when I was a kid, uh, my parents showed us these Bible cartoons. And I remember the Bible cartoon about Joseph. He was wearing like this tacky rainbow jacket, you know. And that's kind of the way I've always imagined this story since that time. I just, when we, a lot of us, when we see many colors, we think about like Skittles or something like that, you know. So I just want you to know, that's not actually what's going on here. When we, what, what's, what is the, the, the writer is meaning for us to know is that this is just a really nice coat, okay. By many colors, the idea is that this is just a, an ornate coat, an ornate robe. It was high quality. It was very expensive, which is why. Jacob got it for Joseph. He was his favorite. So Joseph is a tattletale. He's his dad's favorite. And he has this very, very nice coat. Now, add to that the fact that Joseph also had dreams. And he didn't, ha- he didn't just have dreams, but he was the kind of person who likes to tell people what they dream. You guys know, you know what I'm talking about. You, we might be we, some of us maybe are those kinds of people. I, I, I remember when Melissa and I first got married, uh, it was the day after our honeymoon, you know, everything is great, the world is good, and, and we're kind of having our first morning together, and the first thing Melissa does before we really start talking about anything is she starts just telling me about everything she dreamed the night before. And I remember thinking, Lord, I didn't know. This is, <laughs> what do I do here? And so for, for and that's just kind of her thing. She likes to tell me her dreams and, uh, and bizarre whatever. And so I, I, I love to listen. I love to listen to those dreams, sweetie. Uh, especially first thing in the morning. So uh, and here's the thing. J- Joseph, he, he was telling his dream, that his brothers didn't like his dreams because the dreams that Joseph told were dreams about his brothers bowing down to him. And verse 5 says that they hated him even more for this. And apparently Joseph didn't care because he had the same dream again and he told his brothers again. Joseph said in verse 9, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And so if we put it all together, Joseph is a tattletale. He's the favorite of his father. He wears a really nice coat and he told his brothers that he is going to reign over him. He's going to reign over his family. And so his brothers hate him and you probably would too. You would hate him too. The text tells us four times, four times how they feel about him in verse four, verse five, verse eight, and verse 11 is the brothers of Joseph hated him and were jealous of him. And the text says they just hated him even more, even more. So there's this building resentment against Joseph. And that's the character situation in the story. That's what leads to this. this the story starts with their conflict. That's what leads to the brother's evil plan against Joseph. And so because we have seen so much conflict between brothers so many times in Genesis, we should wonder, we really should wonder, will brothers ever get along? Like This is a question that's kind of been building for us in the book of Genesis. Up to this point, all we have seen, all we know about brothers is that they hate one another. Will they ever live peaceably? Will brothers ever have unity? That's a question we should ask. And the answer is yes, but most of the time, no. One of the worst effects of sin in the world is relational strife. We, we know relationships are hard and they break and it's painful and we all have our stories. It's hard to work together. Teams are not easy. Brothers dwelling together in unity does not happen every day. And in fact, it is so special when it does that we have a psalm all about that. In Psalm 133, behold, How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like precious oil 
on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord has commended blessing, life forevermore. Psalm 133 is envisioning the new creation. This is a psalm that is picturing for us what a restored earth is going to look like. And the first thing mentioned is brothers dwelling in unity, which means brothers dwelling in unity is a taste of heaven. What is typical in this world is fighting and division. When we hear about those things happening, so what? When we hear about things not going well, we shouldn't be surprised. That's the story of this world, man. That's, that's, that's how it goes most of the time. The miracle is when things go well. The miracle is when brothers have unity, and it's something you can only have because of the gospel, which is why Paul commands unity in Philippians 2, and it's why the enemy targets unity. It's a miracle. Brothers dwelling in unity is a piece of the new creation that we can experience in this old world. And I want to just be honest and be up front with you for a minute and tell you something. This is a little parenthetical, okay, a little aside here. One of the greatest gifts to our church is our pastoral team. And one of the greatest miracles in our church is that we all get along. It is a miracle that the eight pastors on our pastoral team have unity, that we love one another. It's not shallow. It's not accidental. We pray for it and work for it and sacrifice for it, and we wrestle God for it, and God has given it to us. He has given our pastoral team unity. Look, we know, I know, there are all kinds of things that we want to figure out as a church, things we were trying to to do and improve. But kind of stepping back, and we were able to do that this past weekend, kind of looking at what God has done in our church the last year, I I really believe, and I hope hope, hope this lands well, I hope you know this, I think the one steady stream of health into this body is our pastoral team. And so I want to just take a minute and say to my seven pastor brothers and to their wives, thank you. I love you, brothers. I'm grateful to you, brothers. And church, pray for us. Pray for our unity. Pray for our team. All right, close that, princess. It's Pastor Appreciation Month, so that was my appreciation for these guys. So. Sorry. All right, the characters in this story are Joseph and his brothers, And Joseph's brothers hate him. They hate him. And that's what leads to the conspiracy. That's where it begins to get more relevant to us. Here's the conspiracy. So we did context. We did characters. Now we're here in the conspiracy. This is how it goes in verse 13. One day, Jacob, he sends Joseph out to check on his brothers because apparently Joseph was a reliable informant uh, when it comes to what his brothers are doing. And so Joseph goes out to find them. Eventually, he gets pointed in the right direction. And then as Joseph is walking closer to his brothers, the the brothers look out, and they see Joseph in the distance. And so the brothers can see Joseph, but he's far enough away that he can't hear them talking. And so as Joseph is getting closer, they begin to conspire together against him. you got to imagine the scene. Joseph is in the distance. He's getting closer. As he's getting closer, they're conspiring together. In verse 19, they say, here comes this dreamer. Verse 20, come now. Let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Then Reuben has a better idea. Because Reuben has his own conspiracy within the conspiracy. Reuben doesn't want to kill Joseph, but he wants to throw Joseph into a pit so that later he can come back and rescue Joseph and present him to Jacob. Reuben wants to stage himself as the hero. And so as this conspiracy is happening, as the deceit is going on here at multiple levels, Jacob finally gets to them. And in verse 23, they surround Joseph. They tear off his nice coat. And they throw him in a pit just like Reuben suggested. And then they sit down to have lunch. (laughs) 
which is one of, I think, the most bizarre things in this story because the text tells us that Joseph is in a pit without water. The text says that. He's in a pit without water. And his brothers are sitting down having lunch. And then as they're having lunch, they see a caravan of traders and Judah, ding, 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 Judah suggests another idea. Rather than let Joseph die, Judah says, hey, let's sell Joseph to these traders. And they, they all agree. And it can be a little bit confusing in the text because the Ishmaelites are mentioned three times. And then we see in verse 28, the Midianite traders are mentioned. I think these are the same people. But the reason that the Midianites are mentioned in verse 28, 36 is because Midian is going to become an important part of the story of Moses. All right. There are all kinds of little details happening in this story that are going to have all kinds of significance later. We just read through it. We don't even see them. But later, they're going to make sense. The main thing we should see here now is that Joseph ends up being sold to slavery in Egypt. Reuben finds out about this. Of course, he's upset about it. Meanwhile, the brothers uh, stick back to their original plan. They fake Joseph's death. They soak his nice coat in goat's blood. And they tell Jacob that a fierce animal has devoured Joseph, which is another subtle irony in the text. The word fierce is the same Hebrew word for evil. And so they say an evil animal has destroyed him, which in the story, the only evil animals we see are, are Joseph's brothers themselves. It's a little irony in the text. When Jacob hears about Joseph's death, he is distraught, he mourns, he refuses to be comforted. And then in verse 35, he says, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Another irony, we'll see that later. The last thing we see in 37, the last thing in chapter 37 is that Joseph is in Egypt. We're told that twice here in verse 28 and verse 36. Uh, Joseph ends up in Egypt. And this is just the start. The story of Joseph gets even more intense, but it all comes back. Everything we're going to see in the next several weeks comes back to this here in chapter 37. The whole story of Joseph is really centered on what's being said here in verse 20 when the brothers decide to destroy Joseph and then they say, now we will see what will become of his dreams. The whole story of Joseph comes back to this verse 20 in chapter 37. Now we'll see. Now we'll see. The most sinister and ironic words in the Bible that sort of ring in our ears throughout the rest of the story. And then when we think about these words, this is where I think it starts to hit close to home for us. That's because we should hear in these words, not just the brothers of Joseph, but we should hear in these words, the same words that are spoken by every enemy of God toward God's plans for his people. Now we'll see. These are the same words that have been spoken over and over again for thousands of years. Every satanic scheme against God and against God's people have included this little line. Now we'll see. We read it here in Genesis 37, and, and we, we read it here said about Joseph. We read it in the book of Job said about Job. And we should imagine that it's also said about us even in this present day. If you trust in Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are part of the people of God, and God has plans for his people. God has plans for you. And the enemy is always trying to destroy those plans. And in every new attempt to destroy the work of God, in your life, the enemy says about you, now we'll see. So I want you to, we have to use our imaginations here a little bit. Can you imagine that being said about you? Satan's conspiracy against God's people is a conspiracy against us against you and me. Now we will see what will become of their lives. Now we will see what will become of their faith. Now we will see what will become of God's plan for them. Now we will see. 
And what will they see? The question feels so open-ended. It seems risky and unknown, right? I mean, it's a good thing here in Genesis. We can read to the end of this book. We can read to the end of this story, and we can find out what happens. There is a Genesis 50 in the book of Genesis, but what about for us right now? Like, What about for my life? What about for your life? What? If the enemy is conspiring against us, what will the outcome be for us? If now we'll see is said about you and me, do we have any hope? That's an important question. And the answer is, of course, yes, absolutely. So much of the Bible is written for you to have hope in the midst of affliction. And even today, like in this moment right now, you might be right in the middle of a now we'll see. And if you are, I want to tell you that the Bible is full of truth meant to comfort you. The Bible is full of truth meant to encourage you. And so I want to hear in closing just mention a few things. Three words of comfort. Three quick words of comfort. Number one, God is sovereign over your details. And we know this. We've seen this in Genesis, but it shows up so vividly in this story of Joseph. That It has to do with all these word plays and all these reversals that are happening in the story. All kinds of little things are happening in chapter 37 that are going to show up later. In fact, in chapter 50, in the last sermon in Genesis, we're going to be pointing back here to chapter 37. There are details happening in this chapter that are part of God's greater plan. And that's important to know because a lot of times in our affliction, when we're under attack, it can feel absolutely chaotic. It can feel pointless. It can feel absurd. But in reality, there is not a single hair on our heads outside the knowledge of God. In reality, God is sovereign in his care for you. God's sovereign care for you is meticulous. There's this great sentence I read last week in, in John Calvin's The Institutes. And uh, Calvin is just so beautiful. He's talking about the providence of God. And this is what he says. He says, we may safely rest in the protection of him upon whose nod depends whatever opposes our welfare. We may safely rest in the protection of him upon whose nod depends whatever opposes our welfare. Which means... Whatever is coming your way, whatever is off in the distance of your life and you can't see it, you can't hear it, whatever is coming your way, it has to pass through the nod of your Father who loves you. Think about that. Every detail, every detail. God is sovereign over these details. Second word of comfort here is, is the, the fog never stays. And we heard this in the great song, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And uh, I think something special we see here in chapter 37 is, is there, are, there, there are important details that we see here that we don't actually know they're important until later. When we read them at first, and it just happened, so many things were said, but we don't get it because it's almost like a fog. It's just hanging over this text. The details are not yet clear to us. Chapter 37, I think, is kind of like fog, or kind of like snow in early October. Okay. Think about last Sunday. Okay. Here's the thing. It never stays. Look out there right now. It was foggy and cold, and it's maybe still cold outside, but it was snowy and gray last week. And a lot of times, look, that's, that's what life feels like for us. Life feels foggy. Life feels cold and snowy. But the encouragement here is to hang on. The light will break through. God will shine through. It happens here in the story of Genesis, and it will happen in your lives. One day we will see it all. What's the line in, in the song, God Moves in a Mysterious Way? Well, we don't know now. How's it go? Well, we don't know now. We're going to know one day. 
or something like that. Read the, read the psalm. It was great. I should have wrote it down. Here's the third thing. This is the main part. The story of Genesis, the story of Jesus is your story. All right, so we, we've been talking about the story of Joseph, and I said the story of Joseph is relevant for our lives, and it is, but there's another person and another story that is even more relevant, and it's actually to this person and to his story that Joseph is meant to point. The earliest Christian readers of Genesis and the story of Joseph have always understood Joseph to be a type of Jesus. That means that Joseph is a person in the Bible that is meant to resemble and point to Jesus. Joseph is a, he's like a foreshadowing of Jesus who is to come. And we can see his resemblance in the story. Joseph is a beloved son, betrayed and abandoned by his closest companions. And he is sold to the handcuffs of Gentiles for a handful of silver. And that's just chapter 37. Right, The connections to Jesus in this story only grow deeper, and that's where we find the comfort. That's where we find the encouragement. With the story of Joseph, we hope things will work out for us the way they worked out for him. But with the story of Jesus, we know things will work out for us the way they worked out for him. That's because the story of Jesus is our story, church. Because we are united to Jesus by faith, it means that everything that Jesus has faced, he faced on our behalf. It means that when Jesus was tempted, we were tempted. When Jesus obeyed, it's like we obeyed. When Jesus was sentenced to death, it's like we were sentenced to death. When he was crucified, we were crucified with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And when all the enemies of God said about Jesus, now we'll see. When all the enemies of God said that about Jesus... They also said that about us. And that's our comfort because what did they see? What did they see? They saw the greatest reversal that could ever be. They saw the death of death in the death of Jesus because Jesus did not stay dead. They saw resurrection. Jesus is raised from the dead. Jesus lived the truest life, and he won the greatest victory. And that life and that victory is yours if you are united to him. By faith in Jesus, the story of Jesus becomes your story, and there is no greater comfort than that. That's what this table sings to us every week. So as the band and as the pastors come, prepare the table. I just want to remind you, every time we take the bread and the cup, we are remembering, we are saying that our lives and our hope and our future is bound up in Jesus. All of his benefits belong to us. All of his blessings are our blessings. And when we take the bread and we take the cup, we are saying that God has good for us in Jesus. God means good for us in Jesus. And so we take the bread and cup in gratitude and in confidence. And if that's you this morning, if you would say that, if you trust in Jesus, we want to invite you to eat and to drink with us. We're going to serve the bread first, just retain it. I'll come back up. We'll eat the bread all together. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.